So I'm going to jump into the uh, basic requirements of our mission. Um, we have two uh, general uh, requirements that were kind of drove our design. The first was that we had to continuously sample the surface um, and atmosphere of Uranus via remote sensing. So we needed to capture around the planet and stay there to do remote sensing observations. Um, we also needed to probe the atmosphere with an atmospheric probe uh, three times over five years, which meant that we needed to do it evenly. So every two and a half years, we needed to have an atmospheric probe descending into the atmosphere. Uh, we are to determine the atmospheric uh, structure, composition, um, and zonal winds, all at a high spatial resolution. Um, and then we're supposed to look at the temporal evolution while we're on the planet. Um, our orbital spacecraft is there for about five years, and we're going to see uh, a five years of temporal evolution in the atmosphere. Next slide. We're also supposed to determine the three-dimensional structure of the magnetosphere. Um, this is going to be done with the magnetometer boom, and this will um, also determine the high order structure of the temporal evolution of the uh, planetary dynamo. So by understanding the magnetosphere, we can bring information about the internal dynamo of the planet. Um, our atmospheric probe has some specific requirements for it. Uh, it is supposed to determine the isotopic ratios of the elements shown, um, as well as the noble gas abundances in the atmosphere um, at the probe descent location. Uh, it is also looking at the structure of the atmosphere at the probe descent location. So this means determining temperature, pressure, and density, and kind of building an atmospheric model as it descends. The uh, thermal environment is also uh, you know, one of the key goals of our mission is to discover the thermal environment. Um, doing so will help. Uh, we need to determine the uh, mass distribution of the planet, which will really give a lot of information about the thermal environment. Uh, we also want to look at the temporal evolution of the thermal environment while we're there. Uh, once again, over five years, we'll get to see how the system changes. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have a requirement to do remote sensing of the moons and rings, uh, specifically the, uh, three of the five major moons. Miranda, Umbriel, and Oberon, which is the innermost, the middle, and the outermost <coughs> of the major moons, um, as well as remote sensing of the rings. We also have a resolution requirement for imaging of the moons, so we need to get close enough to get our 400 meter per pixel uh, requirement in order to uh, image the moons uh, within our resolution requirement. Uh, we also have some time restrictions. We also have some time restrictions set forward by the customer. Uh, we have to launch. Uh, we have to be in the air with our first vehicle by uh, December 31st of 2020. Um, and the response to this RFP is due May 30th of this year. Additionally, we have some other restrictions, including we are not allowed to use uh, JPL's Deep Space Network 70 meter dishes, which means we're relegated to using the 35 meter dishes for Earth communication. Uh, we're also um, not allowed to have any mission single point failures unless they're proof tested structures. So, this will all be covered in greater detail later in the presentation. We also have some uh, miscellaneous requirements as far as the reliability of the mission. Um, our overall mission is required to have a 40% reliability. Um, the orbiter and probe combination, however, has to have an 80% reliability. This means that any other vehicles needed to fulfill the RFP uh, need to just fulfill the 40% mission requirement and they don't have specific uh, vehicle-driven uh, reliability requirements. Uh, the power subsystem is also designed to have a 5% end-of-life margin and uh, batteries need to be able to handle uh, two cell failures. The thermal subsystem needs to have redundant heat pipes so that acceptance temperatures are met in case a uh, single heat pipe loss, in case of a single heat pipe loss. <coughs> so our gracious customer has decided to uh, give us a few things to kind of help us out here. Uh, he's decided to pay for our first launch vehicle. Um, additionally, we don't really have the tools uh, to perform cost analysis, so that is not presented um, in this presentation. So. Our customer has also um, been stockpiling plutonium-238. <laughs> he, uh, he has the ability to get his hands on as much as we need uh, in order to power and heat our spacecraft. Um, as I'm sure you guys know, the worldwide plutonium-238 supply is in very diminishing supply. Um, but our customer has assured us that he can definitely get us what we need. 
And so, uh, so that is one thing that he has put forward. Um, since we do need, next slide please. Since we do need to use a radioactive uh, power generator, and it will be discussed throughout our presentation, and since the power subsystem is presenting so late, um, I feel it's appropriate to introduce you to the ASRG, or Advanced Sterling Radioisotopic Generator. Uh, we'll be using these on our spacecraft in order to power um, our spacecraft. They produce nominally 135 watts, um, and can be overcharged to 143 watts at the beginning of life. Um, over the 21-year mission that we've seen, they degrade to about 100 watts. Um, and the power subsystem will get into much further detail about these uh, much later in the presentation. Uh, the customer has also provided us a suite of instruments. Uh, with these instruments, we uh, should be capable of completing the RFP to the resolution requirements um, with the high and low spatial resolutions that are required. Uh, we'll be able to, to see all of this uh, with this instrument suite. Um, a lot of these, uh, all of these instruments actually um, came from either Messenger or New Horizons. So they've all been flown before, they're all known to be operational. Um, and he's basically given us these instruments uh, and a spec sheet to go along with them. So we, uh, so we know what's going on. Excuse me. Yes, of course. Just uh, in, in more practical terms, the 40% mission reliability. Yes. If, if you said it in, in English, I can understand. Does that mean that there's a 40% chance that the mission is going to be successful? I believe that the mission has to be 40% by the map. Um, I think the reliability people might be able to handle this question a little bit better than I can. Uh, okay, so uh, the total mission reliability, yes, that's 40%, as you'll find out uh, as we. Uh, go under our architecture. Uh, the, uh, our mission is composed of several vehicles working in unison together. So all of them combined to have a mission reliability of 40%. However, the primary spacecraft that will be conducting most of the science operations, that needs to have an 80% reliability. Okay. All right, thank you. So we're going to have these instruments. Yeah. This is the list he's told you to choose from, or he's actually going to provide you? He's actually going to provide these instruments to us. <coughs> And it's very nice of him. He's very generous. <laughs> right, Dave, you're up. getting generous in your old age. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, I want to introduce you kind of to what our progression of our design uh, over the last few months has been. Um, we first started with the orbiter spacecraft which would carry three probes. One would be dropped at the Uranus Sphere of Influence Crossing, um, a hyperbolic entry probe. And two of them would be elliptical entry probes, dropped from an eccentric orbit. Um, and these probes would have um, propulsion systems and AC systems so that they could deorbit themselves. Uh, the orbiter spacecraft would perform all of the remote sensing of Uranus, and uh, it would also perform a moon tour uh, to get the remote sensing of the moon dunes. The fuel for the moon tour uh, was kind of a killer for us. Uh, we couldn't fit in the launch vehicle uh, with the amount of fuel that we were using, at least for the moon tour that we had planned. And the eccentricities of the orbits uh, kind of that happened because of the moon tour didn't really agree with the elliptical probes. And so uh, we moved on to our second architecture. In our second architecture, uh, we kind of hand waved the moon tour. We said we can get, uh, we can do remote sensing of the moons. Uh, since we're going to be in the plane of the orbit, and uh, we'll be able to complete the RFP like this. Uh, our customer wasn't too happy about this, and uh, instilled the 400 meter per pixel requirement, which we now have today. So this uh, drove our design to change. We also found that putting a propulsion system on an atmospheric probe with an ADC system was just a little too complicated. Uh, we really didn't have the it just wasn't feasible. So we also dropped the elliptical entry probes for our next design. Because we could no longer draw probes from an elliptical capture orbit, it meant that we had to put multiple vehicles in the air because they needed to be dropped on hyperbolic engines. Uh, because of this, we had to go to a two-launch architecture. Um, our first launch in this architecture would have an orbiter spacecraft which would arrive at Uranus, capture, and perform all of the remote sensing, including a more robust moon tour. Uh, the second launch would include three Uranus probe systems, otherwise known as UPSs, which would deliver uh, the probe packages 
there's two units. Um, these three probes would be staggered to get the, um, the five year, the evenly spaced over five year uh, measurements that we needed. Um, however, it was found that the mass of the UPS was too large for us to fit in the launch vehicle, and so having three of them uh, in the launch vehicle wasn't feasible. Though this architecture is very similar to our final architecture, which is uh, the one we ended up going with and the one that we will see to present today. Uh, we have a orbit vehicle which carries one of the atmospheric probes uh, and then performs all the remote sensing. And then we have two UPS vehicles which are launched together. Uh, they separate uh, right after launch and their trajectories are slightly staggered so that they arrive and get the you know, staggered measurements. <coughs> and this is what we are showing you today. So without further ado, yes? Early on you referred to the surface. Where is that? The surface of Uranus is just, um, defined at the one bar level. So there's really not a, uh, a solid surface, it's just gas all the way down. However, the surface is defined at one bar of pressure. Make this as authentic as possible. Every designer is a wise guy. So, so you're going to be the wise guy for us. Just for a moment, okay. I, I, I smiled when you said the launch, launch had to be by a certain date. Right. You had to be in the air by then. And I suggest to you what you need to do is get out of the air. Get out of the air. Well, we've got to get out of the air once we get there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our next. When you launch, you're getting out of the air. You've been in the air all the time. <laughs> uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass it to Dr. Barrett. And he's going to take you through uh, a more in-depth uh, mission.